All right. It is fitting that this is the animation that precedes Courtney, who's going to share her work with you from this semester about the mental models we make and the distinctions we draw when discussing race in America. So without further ado, that'll finish up and you can click right there. Let's click it to your next slide twice. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. It is my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, and I will direct my discussion today on the importance of capturing perspectives, a systems thinking approach to race in America. Now, when we think of a topic like race, I would uh, suggest that various mental models come to mind. So. We each individually harbor our own mental models of race, what racial categories are in the United States, uh, how they came to be, who belongs in each category. And I'd first like to direct your attention to a PBS activity, which really challenges those existing models of race that we each harbor each and every day. This activity is entitled, Can You Tell Someone's Race by Looking at Them? And it's a sorting activity facilitated by PBS. You're welcome to go online and try it. And it implores users to try their hand at sorting photographs of individuals into the appropriate racial categories. And those racial categories included in the activity are those commonly seen on US census documents, um, components of our everyday American life. And those categories, racial categories, are black, white, Hispanic, Latino, American Indian, and Asian. Now I asked two of my Cornell colleagues, one international student and one student from the United States, uh, to participate in this activity for me, and these are the results. Uh, as you can see, the results are the following for the American student on the top uh, illustration and the international student on the bottom. And the results were that of the 20 individuals photographed, only 20% of those photographs were placed in the correct racial category. And by correct racial category, I mean uh, placed in a racial category consistent with the way in which the individual photographed would choose to identify or classify themselves. Uh, which means, therefore, that 80% of people were incorrectly identified. And this discord, this disconnect, uh, points to a fundamental difference in mental models which I believe is connected to the fourth rule of systems thinking, which is perspectives. Systems thinking, as has been discussed throughout the day, um, embraces four simple rules, DSRP, or distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives, to attempt to understand complex real world systems, such as models of race in the United States. As we saw in our sorting activities, Distinction embodies an identity other mentality, whereby when we ascribe something an identity, we are therefore saying it is not these other things. When we place a photograph in one racial category, we are saying that it does not belong in these other categories. Systems pertains to the way in which things can be broken down into parts or lumped into holes, and I would argue that our phenotype analysis of individuals and our daily interaction occurs in part whole systems. Similarly, relationships are the ways in which ideas or things relate to one another. And throughout my presentation, I will demonstrate how racial profiles have evolved over time, how they are um, interrelated and mixed throughout time. And perspectives um, is the way in which something can be evaluated from a point or a view. And I will argue that there are various perspectives that one can take on race, um, and we'll look into those now. So what is race? Well, that really depends on your perspective. The United States Census Bureau, when uh, attempting to explain how consumers typically fill out the census document, um, says that the racial categories generally reflect a social definition of race recognized in this country and not an attempt to define race biologically, anthropologically, or genetically. Now, the problem with this social definition of race, as we saw in the sorting activity, based on phenotypes, is that our mental models that we employ when we participate in this racial sorting or when we try to categorize people, often it fails to approximate reality or the real world. There's some kind of disconnect there. So I argue that mental model one of race 
which captures a social perspective of race based on phenotypes, should be replaced by mental model two of race, which captures an anthropological perspective and biological and genetic perspectives on race. The anthropological perspective embodies the economic, social, and political factors that are the reason and the justification for the advent of race in the United States. And the biological and genetic, genetic perspective captures um, projects of human genetic analysis that offer an alternative lens to the way in which we view race. And my challenge to each and every one of you as you uh, listen to this presentation is that you really think about and consider the mental models of race um, that you inhabit and the perspectives contained in those models. So one way that race has been measured socially throughout time is in the United States Census. When the census was first taken in the year 1790, U.S. Marshals would go and survey homes and identify individuals in that home with a particular racial group based, of course, on their own mental model, their own interpretation of those individuals in that home. It was not until the year 1960 that individuals were able to self-identify. When the census was first taken, there were three census groups. By the year 2010, at the last 10-year census, there were 19 census groups, a progression that looks a little bit like this. And this is just a snapshot of various census points in time, but it demonstrates how racial groups were added, amended, taken away, how they evolved throughout the years, which speaks to the fact that race is uh, something that more reflects the public opinion and social attitudes about race instead of something that is stagnant and can consistently, clearly be defined over time. Categories such as mulatto, mulatto slaves, Indians, quadroons, and octoroons are all names of racial categories that were um, included at some point historically on the United States Census. And to conclude, in terms of that social racial perspective, that really goes to show you how um, names of racial groups can change, how qualifications of different racial groups can change, and how race can be better looked at from anthropological and biological perspectives. From an anthropological perspective, race was employed in this country to accomplish economic, social, and political objectives. So when Europeans and Africans first arrived as indentured servants in the United States, there was a fear among the smaller ruling elite of a rebellion of the servitude class, which is larger inside, against those in power. So race was instituted as a mechanism to divide those with similar economic interests, and race was used to elevate the social status of Europeans in society, to legal, legally elevate them in society, and it was used to continue to oppress um, the African population in the United States. In fact, once these racial categories were established, Negro, mulatto, and Indian slaves could be used as collateral, they could be uh, used as credit, uh, sold as real estate, killed without consequence, and maimed, whipped, or even killed for associating with whites. Um, furthermore, they were forbidden to do things like earn money, gather in groups, breed, or raise food. And things like these slave codes and these prohibited slave laws really work to codify a social a hierarchical structure of power in the United States. And these things were justified by scientists, for example, who advanced that uh, Africans were an inferior human race. And there were scientists that would advance this theory through a variety of techniques, including uh, skeletal analysis and craniology, and this here implies a de uh, degeneration of the uh, races over time into distinct racial categories. Uh, similarly, skeletal analysis here to accomplish a particular purpose, things like eugenics and phrenology. And here we see our distinctions again being made in part whole systems to try and justify scientifically the oppression of less desirable social groups, um, such as groups of color or immigrant populations in the United States. The Human Genome Project was completed in 2003, and it was an attempt to sequence the entire human genome. And it went around the globe and sampled various populations and found that, in fact, there are not multiple races and there is not any hierarchical order, but that there is a single human species. And that single human species has origins in Africa. Things such as skin color that we in the United States associate with distinct races of people can be explained scientifically by 
uh, ancestral populations that migrated closer to or farther from intense sources of heat, such as the equator, and the amount of pigmen more or less needed in their skin in order to adapt to their environment. Um, so again, none of these observable traits that people typically associate with race are inherent traits, but whether they're complex traits in different allelic frequencies that are inhabited over time. So I challenge you all again to reevaluate the perspectives contained in your own mental models of race. And when it comes not only to race, but various controversial topics and kind of culturally sensitive ones, perhaps you can take or adopt different perspectives in order to more comprehensively understand these complex systems. Again, DSRP allows us to create mental models and capture critical perspectives that better approximate the real world. And when we do this, our mental models can benefit more, both the consumers of those models and those that are impacted by its externality. Thank you so much.